grand rounds today. This is, uh, as you see, is our Hollander Endowed Lecture. Uh, this is one of the named lectureships we have uh, that are shared amongst the divisions. And today I'm introducing uh, Dr. Brett Rutherford, who is our endowed lectureship in geriatric psychiatry. Um, I do want to first start uh, with some housekeeping. Um, Stefan Heckers uh, is the CME Activity Director. He has no financial relationships related to the content of this activity to disclose. Uh, Dr. Rutherford uh, has no financial relationships either to disclose. Um, the Psychiatry Grand Rounds receives no commercial support. The talk may uh, mention off-label or investigational use of drugs. And if so, uh, we've asked Dr. Rutherford to disclose that when he talks about that. The CME, you can get CME credit or CE credit, uh, CME credit on the code list on your screen. It will also be on the host profile throughout the meeting. You have to text this within 24 hours to get credit. Uh, as a courtesy to our speakers, this is a Zoom webinar. So your Zoom microphone is muted. We'll take questions at the end of the talk. Uh, you can either raise your virtual hand or enter in questions into the chat um, and I'll help moderate that. Or if you wanna verbally ask it, we can unmute your microphone at that point. Um, and so with that, let me uh, formally introduce you to Dr. Brett Rutherford. So Brett really has an amazingly impressive academic pedigree. He did his bachelor's work at Harvard, his medical training at Columbia University, and he liked New York so much that he stayed around for the rest for his subsequent career. So he was first a resident psychiatry at Columbia. He later finished a research fellowship in affective disorders, also at Columbia. Um, and in 2010, he joined the faculty and is currently a fairly senior associate professor. You know, I think when we think about these endowed lectureships, we like to pick people who are quite senior and have been quite uh, leaders in the field. And although Brett clearly has a lot less uh, gray hair than some of us do, uh, I think that that, is, that doesn't really highlight the importance he's had to the field. Um, he's really turned into a, a really important leader in the field, particularly in making geriatric psychiatry more geriatric and thinking about what is really unique about our older populations beyond what's going on in the brain. His earliest work really focused, interestingly enough, on more adult depression and focusing on the placebo response. And in some ways, how can we weaponize the placebo response? How can we take what we know about why people uh, get better despite not getting drug? And how can we better integrate that into our clinical practice? His more recent work has really focused on the interface between aging, geriatric medicine, and depression. He has been a really strong proponent of looking at neuropsychiatric illness as models for accelerated aging. He's also brought into, like I said, geriatric medicine of this and has done work looking at how hearing impairment may contribute to depression. He's been interested in how the neurobiological changes that may contribute to depression also affect gait and other things that our patients and colleagues care about. Um, and so really this unique outside the brain perspective has been really, really important. And I think also say it's really impressed me is that he's done work outside geriatric depression and is one of the only people I know of that's really doing work looking at the neurobiology of PTSD in older adults and how that may contribute to cognitive decline and other bad outcomes in that population. Um, great scientist, tremendous success in his grant world. And a personal note, uh, he is a research collaborator of mine. And to tell you how these things work, when I first invited Brett to this, we were at the beginning of a collaboration and I proposed that coming to this meet to this session, he was agreeable, so this will be a great opportunity as we work on a grant and build our collaboration and this will set us up for grant renewals in the future. Little did I realize that we plow full steam ahead and we actually have an active collaborative grant that I'm just very excited to be doing with them. In this time working with Brett, he has been just shown himself to be a fantastic scientific partner, very thoughtful, very careful, very detail oriented, and still not losing the big picture of why we're doing this and what we're doing this for and showing a lot of compassion for our patients uh, that we work with. And so I'd like to stop with this and turn it over to Brett. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Warren, and thank you so much for that very kind, uh, wonderful introduction. I'm really honored to uh, be invited to give the Hollander Endowed Lecture and especially to be invited by uh, you, uh, a close friend and very valued colleague. So thanks, Warren, very much. 
Uh, I'll be speaking on dopaminergic decline, psychomotor slowing, and late-life depression, which I hope will be an avenue towards uh, precision interventions for older adults. I don't have any disclosures relevant to this presentation. I have received uh, support in the form of hearing aids for a study of hearing and late life depression. I will be discussing off-label use of levodopa carbidopa or Cinemet, which is commercially available for Parkinson's disease and we're using it in our depressed patients. So my talk today is gonna have four parts. Uh, for time purposes, I'm gonna just very briefly uh, describe some of why, why we should be studying late life depression and its great importance. Then I'm gonna quickly move to how we've come to focus on slowed thinking and movement as important uh, you know, features related to late life depression and some of our uh, investigations and their underlying neurobiology. I'll probably spend the bulk of the talk zooming in on levodopa as a treatment strategy for late life depression. And I hope I'll have time at the end to open things back up more broadly and talk about uh, my perspective that uh, conceptually late life depression as a complex geriatric syndrome could be an important means to facilitate aging informed novel therapeutics. So to begin with late life depression, unfortunately the state of the art until surprisingly recently was uh, not great. The perspective was that depression, whether it occurred in a 25 year old or 75 year old was pretty much the same thing. So you can see here from this quote that treatment of depression in the aged is not generically different from treatment of depression in younger individuals. Uh, but it was really starting in the 1990s, work done by Warren Taylor and, and colleagues at Duke being very important in this, that we began to appreciate important differences between uh, people with young people with depression as kind of symbolized by this picture on the left and our older depressed patients. There's important differences in phenomenology and the types of symptoms people have. We often refer to late life depression as depression without sadness. We get less sad blue mood. We get much more somatic pain. Uh, also, there's very prominent cognitive uh, features in late life depression compared to depression in younger adults. Executive dysfunction being present in about half of late life depressed patients. Older adults seem to respond less well to standard antidepressants compared to younger adults. We see lower response and remission rates as I'll get into in a moment. And the, the typical course of late life depression is uh, tends to be chronic, marked by brittle response to our treatments and a lot of recurrence. So in sum, if you take nothing else away from today's talk, I hope you will take away that depression is not depression. The life's depression in an older adult has different causes, different manifestations, and will likely respond to different treatments compared to depression in younger adults. My mentor, Stephen Roos, uh, often refers to late life depression as part of the axis of evil in late life, along with its compadres of cognitive decline and vascular disease. And so late, those who treat older adults will know that depression is one of our uh, main things that we help patients with. Although you wouldn't always know it from uh, national epidemiologic surveys where you typically see as here on the left, declining prevalence of major depressive disorder across the lifespan being about four to 6% in people over 65. Um, however, this doesn't capture, this may not capture the whole picture as I said, the phenomenology of late life depression is different from depression in younger adults. There may be an issue of underdiagnosis in uh, older adults. Also, there is a lot of, about 25% of community dwelling older adults have significant depressive symptoms that don't meet full criteria for MDD. That rises to more like 50% in institutional settings. And if you look at depressive symptoms, uh, as opposed to full syndromal MDD, we generally see that declining over the lifespan and then really picking up after age 60. Late life depression is also important because it's associated very troublingly with uh, our worst outcomes in neuropsychiatry. It's a foremost reversible risk factor for dementia, where we think, uh, among other things, it may be lowering brain reserve and a moderator of neurodegenerative disorder pathology as they uh, take their course and lead to dementia, depression through perhaps to glucocorticoid toxicity in the hippocampus leading to atrophy and memory problems due to inflammation and white matter disease leading to executive dysfunction, lower brain health and kind of lower the bar for neurodegeneration to uh, get over. 
Also, of course, the people who kill themselves in the United States and worldwide are older adults, specifically older white men. Whereas young people make more attempts, the, uh, the highest completed suicide rates are in older white men. Older patients give less notice, they use more lethal means. Uh, that's a late life depression can be lethal. Thirdly, our treatments don't work too well for late life depression. And available antidepressants are associated with lower response and remission rates in older adults. This is just an illustration from our clinic at the time I made this slide, a few hundred patients. You see in, in people under 60, we normally see 50%-ish response rates to medication, at least in placebo-controlled trials. Uh, that goes down to under 40% in older adults, remission rates similarly declining. We've done a bunch of meta-analyses of antidepressant medications and we see similar results where we see lower drug response in people over 60. It's also true if you look within studies, this, this was a study by Stephen Roos and uh, patients with depression over 75 didn't separate from, citalopram did not separate from placebo and we saw rather low response and remission rates. And not, so perhaps uh, you get the implication that we use all these antidepressant medications in our older adults, oftentimes in the absence of evidence in specifically older populations. We simply generalize on the basis of clinical trials performed in younger adults that these medications are gonna work similarly in older adults. And I hope to uh, get across a significant concern about this generalization of uh, the evidence base and why that we may be on shaky ground doing that. We really need to do studies specifically in older adults so that we know how well medications work. Also, our, the endpoints we care about in older adults are different sometimes. We want to we want to know about cognition and physical function and outcomes important for older adults and also, of course, safety. So that's just a brief primer on late life depression and why it's important. If we, let's start getting into psychomotor slowing. You may be aware that probably the uh, paramount cognitive aging phenomenon is uh, slowing of uh, processing speed over time. I could put up a million uh, figures to demonstrate this. These are just some people from patients from our clinic where you see this is digit symbol test uh, coding on, on waste four performance. It declines as age of uh, the individual increases. I was amused to see this in uh, PNAS recently. This is chess playing ability, uh, the elegance and of your chess playing ability across the lifespan. And if you look at this, it actually exactly mirrors the course of processing speed over the lifespan. Processing speed increases during uh, late adolescence and early adulthood, then begins declining at, at, from midlife on. So I submit uh, on the basis of little evidence, but at least, but that uh, slowed processing speed may be a reason why most chess masters are younger. Um, not only do, does everyone normatively experience slowing in processing speed, but pro slow processing speed is particularly critical in our late life depressed patients. And this now classic paper by Merrill Butters, uh, published a number of years ago now, uh, if you look here on the left, slowed processing speed was the most common neuropsychological deficit in the hundred or so late life depressed patients making up this sample. Not only that, but it was processing speed slowing that meet mediated the relationship between predictor variables like age on all other neuropsychological uh, functions. And this has both kind of practical and more mechanistic reasons probably, some of the practical being as Salthaus and others have uh, written lots about, that all, all, all these neuropsych tests are timed. And if you're slow, you generally perform worse on pretty much everything. Also, if you think about cognitive processing, of more complicated, uh, on more complicated tasks where there's multiple steps to be performed. If it's taking you a long time to proceed through multiple processing steps, you tend to lose the products of earlier processing before they can be available in later processing steps. So really, and, and Yvette Shaleen and others have written about for these reasons, processing speed, slowed processing speed really being the core cognitive deficit we see in our late life depressed patients. We've done some work, particularly my colleague Patrick Brown at Columbia to show that slowed processing speed mediates most of the disability associated with depression in older adults. We've shown this in a few different ways, but this was an analysis of data from the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center database, which who were about 3000 patients with MCI, where you see here geriatric depression scale 
uh, there was disability associated with GDS symptomatology in these patients that was largely mediated by slowing on the digit symbol test. So um, processing speed slows over time. It's very common in our late life depressed patients and mediates a lot of the disability we see. It also predicts non-response to antidepressants. In this paper by uh, Yvette Shaleen, uh, she compared processing speed in remitters compared to non-remitters in an antidepressant trial, finding that the non-remitters had significantly slower processing speed. Processing, and there's also many studies I could cite for this, that slowed processing speed is perhaps our, our you know, primary negative prognostic factor for antidepressant treatment of older adults. Not only that, but processing speed doesn't improve when we treat people with antidepressants. It predicts non-response, but even when you can get people's depression better, their processing speed usually doesn't get better. There are some interesting data for vortioxetine being unusual among antidepressants and possibly being associated with increased processing speed following treatment. I think that remains to be seen a little bit, but in this meta-analysis, you know, it, all of these antidepressants are not associated with improvement in processing speed. This was that uh, Stephen Roos study uh, where we did not see any improvement in digit symbol following citalopram treatment. Again, even in the people whose depression gets better, they're still left with this processing speed deficit that has lots of disability and adverse outcomes associated with it. Slight detour here, and I realize I don't have time to explain this fully, but it's an interesting question based on what I've said so far. Why would slowed processing speed be associated with antidepressant non-response? I've only shown you that it's a predictor without really giving you an explanation for how processing speed deficits might interfere with antidepressant response. We've approached this problem through the idea of placebo effects. Warren mentioned that my first incarnation of, as a researcher was as one who studied the uh, neural mechanisms of placebo effects. And you may be aware that uh, when we treat people with medication, the improvement we see is a combination of the specific effects of the medication on our target disorder, but also a host of other factors, including the placebo component of medication response. We've um, zoomed in on exactly what are those active ingredients in placebo response and focused on patient expectancy. Expectancy is a cognition that pertains to how, how much improve, whether and how much I'll improve when someone gives me a treatment. We did this study here in uh, younger adults, well, people really uh, age 24 to 75, where we put people into a research study and we randomized them to differing probabilities of receiving active medication. So we would take a sample of patients, some we increase their probability of active medication, thereby we believed increasing their expectation of improvement. Other, the other groups, probability of receiving active medication decreased, and we expected that might decrease their expectancy. Then both groups received an antidepressant in an eight week long clinical trial. In fact, um, we did, uh, the patients who were randomized to receive 100% chance of active medication as compared to a perceived 50% chance of receiving active medication had a, a much greater increase in expectancy and much better outcomes in this acute antidepressant trial. It was actually fairly impressive. This red line is people who had the high expectancy medication. The blue line was the low expectancy medication. There's no placebo here. It's the same medication, the same uh, types of patients in the same research clinic, but under high expectancy conditions, there was about a five Hamilton point, that they improved five Hamil po Hamilton points more to the same medication, the same doctors, the same clinic, when they had a high expectation of improvement. And in our mediation analyses, expectancy indeed mediated that group effect. Now, we found serendipitously here that the older patients in our sample did not have this expectancy effect. And so we sought to um, explore this a little more in a subsequent study where we randomized late life depressed patients to open medication treatment or placebo controlled medication treatment. Where, and we told patients their randomization status, that was our means of manipulating expectancy. Those in the placebo control group, of course, were not aware and, and treatment was blinded here. They were not aware whether they were seeing medication and placebo, but in fact, this was an asymmetric randomization where most people received medication. So we measured the expectancy difference when we randomized people's certainty of getting medication or only possibly receiving medication. 
Then we treated them and we measured the depression difference, the, the, depress the improvement in depression difference between these two groups. And what we found was, oops, that I, I'm sorry, this is a little hard to see. This is processing speed, performance on just in the congruent condition of naming uh, colored words. This is better, higher processing speed, better performance, so this is worse. So in people who had slowed processing speed, the red line is people who were randomized to the placebo control group. The blue line is people who were randomized to the open group. So in people who had slowed processing speed, we saw no expectancy difference between these two conditions. It was only in people who had intact processing speed where we were able to manipulate their expectation of improvement. When we looked at, we saw less dramatically in terms of depressive symptoms, but a similar pattern of results where if you had slowed processing speed, we did not see much of a depression improvement difference between the conditions, uh, but we did see uh, a, a few point difference in uh, depression in the people who had an in, uh, intact processing speed. So this is a long-winded way of saying one, an, a potential explanation for why individuals with slowed processing speed don't respond as well to antidepressants is that the placebo component of their medication response is truncated when they are, not, are less able to cognitively update their world in the presence of information and about their treatment circumstances. They're, they may be unable to form appropriate ex expectancies about treatment improvement. But, let me just go on to say, what if that's processing speed. What about gait speed? What about physical movement, which we haven't always paid enough attention to in psychiatry? It turns out that gait speed also declines with age. Uh, normatively, we all walk slow. Just if you put someone on a course and you, you ask them to just walk at your average walking speed for this uh, 25 feet, and you measure that you give them some time to speed up and some time to slow down, so you get that average walking speed, we all slow down as we go along. It turns out that something as simple as one's average walking speed is an enormously uh, powerful predictor of neurologic, medical, and psychiatric outcomes. Uh, gait, slowed gait speed, they now call it the fifth vital sign. It's just as important as blood pressure and heart rate and all the rest in determining outcomes. It's very much predicted to mortality, falls, loss of independent living status, very powerful health indicator in older adults. This is an analysis of a Scandinavian data set, again, by Patrick Brown, where we see greatly increased mortality rates in both men and women who had slow gait, that gait that was slower than one meter per second. That's really our cutoff for uh, what is a slow gait, at least in ep epidemiologic uh, settings. You may also have seen a lot of, um, there's been a lot of recent linkages between gait speed and cognition. And um, both in, even in midlife, people who walk slower in their 40s and 50s have worse cognition and do worse longitudinally than people who have intact gait speed. This is a, another uh, Patrick Brown. I'm giving him a lot of press here. I just find this so remarkable. This is an analysis of 3,000 functionally intact uh, adults set age 70 to 79 from the Health Aging and Body Composition Study, pointing to this very toxic, you know, depression is associated with bad stuff on its own. Slowed gait is associated with bad stuff on its own. If you put them both together, it's one plus one equals three or four or five, especially when you add this third component of inflammation. We're not gonna talk a lot about inflammation today, but it's riding silently along with us throughout this talk because it's very related to everything else I'm talking about. But here, I just wanna draw your attention over here. The, when we looked at trajectories within that 10-year follow-up in health uh, ABC study, we were able to discern trajectories of people who had um, intact, rather intact uh, gait speed uh, across follow-up and those who had significant slowing over the course of follow-up. Similarly, there were people who were not depressed at study initiation and remain not depressed. Other people got depressed. If you look at people who had, as compared to people who did not have slow gait, were not inflamed as measured by IL-6 levels and um, did not have slow gait, their mortality, these 70 to 79 year old patients over the course of 10 years was about 44%. That mortality approximately doubled in people who had depression gait slowing and higher levels of IL-6. So this slow gait depression, especially when you add inflammation is a, is a very dangerous uh, and high risk uh, subgroup of uh, older adults. Looking within similar data, I'll just clarify that slow gait 
all on its own is a risk factor for developing depression. Similarly, depression is a risk factor for developing slow gait. A question I'm also often asked is whether slowed processing speed and slowed gait speed is psychomotor retardation associated with depression. And it's not. We've looked at this in a lot of different ways, but uh, psychomotor slowing is really kind of a trait feature as, as compared to a state feature associated with depression. It's not associated with the psychomotor slowing item on the Hamilton. And as I've said, these things typically don't improve when we treat patients with standard antidepressants and the depression gets better. They're still left with slow processing and gait speed. This is a final study that we just published where Patrick treated uh, 100 older adults with uh, a standard antidepressant medication and looked at various uh, frailty indicators as predictors of acute uh, depression response and also um, uh, continue how they fared over the course of a year follow-up. And basically, this is a uh, frailty I think I'm depicting here, but you could put this for slow gait speed and some of the other frailty criteria as well. Uh, it, it, slow gait speed predicts, uh, you know, worse response to um, antidepressants over an acute study, eight weeks, that then persists uh, as you continue treating these people, even with additional medication trials over a year follow-up. So what I've said so far, both processing speed and gait speed slow normatively, but some people slow more than others. And if you slow more than others, you're at high risk of adverse medical and neuropsychiatric outcomes. Slowed processing and gait speed are very common in late life depression. They confer risk for incident depression. They mediate a lot of the other cognitive impairment we see and the disability we associate with depression. This slowing does not respond, uh, patients with this slowing does not, do not respond as well to antidepressants and the slowing isn't effectively treated by antidepressants. So what can we do to get this very high risk group of slowed older adults with depression better? Well, to uh, generate thoughts about that, we're gonna have to understand something about the brain underpinnings of these uh, behaviors. And uh, that takes us to dopaminergic circuits, which importantly underlie both processing speed and gait speed. So you see here the, in red, the substantia nigra pars compacta and the nigro striatal pathway to the dorsal striatum. Also in blue here, the ventral tegmental area projecting to the ventral striatum and the accumbens shell, also important uh, projections to amygdala, hippocampus, and diffusely throughout the, the cortex. And nigrostriatal dopaminergic tone through both the uh, direct and indirect pathways, you know, we relate to, uh, is involved with the coordination of fine tuning of motor movements. You know, most dramatically, we see bradykinesia and Parkinson's disease patients. Mesolimbic and mesocortical dopamine are very involved with cognition, including processing speed. Just to hammer that home a little bit more. There's many studies again that we could put up here. This is a um, dopamine transporter SPECT study of early Parkinson's disease patients demonstrating a relationship between increased dopamine transporter availability and higher speed as measured by trails A. So uh, that is illustrating how processing speed is dependent upon uh, dopamine transporter availability. We can show similar data. This particular one doesn't look as good, maybe, but at least at the lower end of the spectrum here, we see that striatal dopamine transporter availability. This is from Nick Bonin's group at Michigan, is associated with uh, faster gait speed. So we have these dopaminergic indices that are very related to processing speed and gait speed. This gets to something that's been termed the uh, correlative triad, where we have aging. And we have processing speed, which uh, processing and gait speed, which decline over time. We also have dopaminergic uh, signaling, which declines over time. So aging is related to dopaminergic decline, to slowed processing and gait speed. And of course, dopamine, as I've just been saying, is related to psychomotor slowing. So, so we do see this marked decline in various indices of uh, dopaminergic functioning over time. This was a, a well-known a uh, picture from a paper by Nora Volkow in 1998, where you look at raclopride binding in the striatum to individuals across the lifespan, a lot less uh, D2 receptors present in aged individuals compared to younger ones. This is work that um, David Zald was involved with at, at Vanderbilt uh, using phalipride, the phalipride tracer and looking at decreased D2 availability across uh, basal ganglia regions with increasing age. So dopamine 
and a number of um, uh, ways to measure it decreases across the lifespan. The question can be asked and often it, and, I, and in saying this, I should say, I'll definitely defer to Dr. Claussen and other Parkinson's experts who may be in the audience, but at least my understanding, we often, I'm often asked uh, sometimes by my neurologist colleagues, you know, are you just seeing insidious presentations of Parkinson's? What's the relationship between the hypodopaminergic state of aging and Parkinson's disease? After all, depression is exceedingly common in Parkinson's disease, and there are some animal there are some animal models, as I understand it, to indicate that perhaps there's a, a spectrum here between a hypodopaminergic state of aging and Parkinson's disease. Though my reading of the literature is that the canonical view is that that's not the case, actually, that um, the nor normal aging and dopamine declines with normal aging is distinct from Parkinson's disease. And I can tell you, just to give you a better picture, our patients who are slowed and depressed, they do not have stigmata of Parkinson's disease, such as cogwheeling or things like that. They're not grossly, you wouldn't really pick them out as being slowed as they walk down the street. They're, it's more that they fall below a cutoff on gait speed. They're not grossly bradykinetic. So we really see this normative dopamine decline with aging as being associated with hypofunctional dopaminergic circuits rather than uh, a loss of cells and neurodegeneration. And I think that's backed up by a view, such a view is backed up by recent meta-analyses where you see here we have various, uh, you know, pet indices of different aspects of the dopamine system where we see decline in receptors and transporters over time. But really we see off studies usually indicate increasing dopamine synthesis capacity with increasing age. So there is still the ability to synthesize and release dopamine, uh, indicating perhaps that the cells are still present, but simply hypofunctional with aging. As we move towards uh, levodopa, finally, let me just remind you that L-dopa is in the uh, dopamine synthetic pathway and that L-dopa is uh, decarboxylated by ar aromatic L-amino acid decarboxylase into dopamine. When we give exogenous levodopa, it's taken up by presynaptic neurons, decarboxylated into dopamine and packaged into vesicles uh, for release. I just put up this a very nice figure by uh, that was in a, a really good review by Jennifer Fel Felger and Michael Treadway to again just raise the specter of inflammation and that one reason why dopamine may decline across the lifespan is that inflammation increases and that inflammation affects dopamine uh, signaling in a number of ways. For example, the cytokines secreted by active microglia uh, increase cycling through the dopamine transporter. They decrease the amount of dopamine being packaged into vesicles. They also uh, feed back in other ways here to decrease dopamine synthesis. So high inflammation, and you can think of what's been shown by people like Andy Miller and his colleagues and people receiving interferon and, and this kind of malaise and fatigue and anhedonic depression that highly inflamed uh, people get. So to say more about levodopa, of course, levo, as my mentor didn't hesitate to remind me as he initially discouraged my nascent uh, forays into levodopa, he's ah, everyone's looked at levodopa before. And indeed there is a big history of levodopa in psychiatry in the 60, late 60s and early 70s, people tried to treat depression with levodopa. And just interesting, you know, oh, you know, when they did treat these people, we get increased speed of speech, less frozen and depressed, increased psychomotor activity, uh, but it, it eventually didn't work out. Now, why didn't it work out? Look, you might take a peek at these doses here, which are pretty impressive. You know, if we use anywhere from 150 to 450 milligrams of levodopa to treat depression, here we have three to seven grams. And of course, these were patients who were not selected on the basis of being low dopamine. They were giving mega doses of levodopa to all comers. And if somebody does not have a dopaminergic deficit, we would not necessarily expect repletion of dopamine to, to help them very much. So I wasn't necessarily too dissuaded by this. And I'd like to share with you some initial results from a study that we did, uh, which was uh, using this uh, several years ago, part of the NIMH experimental therapeutics approach, this R61, R33 two phase grant where one has a putative treatment and one uh, endeavors to show that it engages a specified target and then goes on to say, 
uh, see if one engages the target, then one does a larger study to see whether the putative treatment affects the target disorder. And we wanna see whether effects on the target disorder are uh, due to or mediated by the target engagement. So we began a study looking at levodopa monotherapy for depression. And we hypothesized that it would, uh, levodopa administration would increase striatal dopamine release as measured by raclopride PET. And it would also engage a functional target of processing and gate speed slowing. So this initial study was just an open study where we uh, did um, pretreatment PET and MRI scans along with neurocognitive and physical function uh, assessment. And then people got a three week uh, levodopa monotherapy study where we started 150, went up to 450 milligrams, and then we did post-treatment scanning. I'll just um, really skip to the point here, which is that the patients were 75, had a mean age of 75, uh, a pretty standard male-female ratio. They had a number of, on average, one and a half prior antidepressant trials. They were depre chronically depressed for a long time. Um, So what did we find? This is a busy slide I'll orient to you. This describes the columns here are, what is the value of the assessment here in the rows at evaluation screen? Then we, it was important to reassess, processing and gate speed are both associated with practice effects. So if you're gonna look at them as outcome measures, the idea is to do multiple pre-baseline testings to allow practice effects to reach an asymptote, then you take that as your week zero and you go forward. So we have week zero, week one, which is the effect of 150 milligrams, week two, which reflects the 300 milligrams of levodopa and week three at 450. We saw uh, significant effects on processing speed, which are these blue outcomes, uh, including digit symbol, where by week three, uh, we saw, um, uh, you know, an effect size is about 0.5 in terms of our ability to increase processing speed. We saw effect size of about 0.4 that we sped up uh, gate speed. Now, while these, uh, and, and even though it was only a three uh, week study, we saw significant declines in depressive symptoms. We were encouraged by these findings because as I've told you, even though 0 0.4, 0 0.5 isn't gigantic in terms of an effect size, it was only a three week study. And as I've shared with you, usually processing and gate speed don't change when we treat people. So having something that changes them is, is promising. We increased uh, dopamine release in the associative and sensory motor striatum. Uh, associative striatum being linked to processing speed, of course, and sensory motor being uh, linked to gate speed. So we did in fact see increased, uh, decreased raclopride binding with um, uh, levodopa administration. I should just say as an interesting side note, you gotta give levodopa on a subacute schedule because we did look at just single dose L-dopa uh, changes in these areas and we saw no change. So it was really in the, after we gave people three weeks of levodopa that we were able to see uh, something in the striatum. Just briefly, uh, levodopa is very, very well tolerated in our patients. We see some nausea, we see some lightheadedness, sometimes vivid dreams and some insomnia, but really you can see uh, most of this is at week one. After patients have been on the medication for a while, we get uh, very minimal side effects and everyone tolerates it quite well. We don't expect another note that gets to whether uh, dopaminergic decline with normal aging is a Parkinsonian phenomenon. We really don't expect our, our patients to be at any kind of risk for dyskinesias. Because um, again, where we have, if you look at these uh, inputs to the striatum from the substantia nigra in normal individuals, um, we would not expect uh, L-dopa to have much of an effect or perhaps it would even have a, a adverse effect on cognition and gait potentially because of this U-shaped curve that we see with dopamine and, and behavior. We think our aged but non-Parkinson's older adults are, have hypofunctional dopamine systems that we're repleting. And the problem would be in our Parkinson's patients, dyskinesia seem to be linked to neurodegeneration of the dopaminergic inputs and uptake of exogenous levodopa 
by serotonergic neurons, which then begin releasing dopamine. And that really seems to be responsible for the dyskinesias that are seen with high dose, long-term levodopa treatment in Parkinson's patients. So we really don't expect our patients here to be at significant risk of that. And we haven't seen any dyskinesias in our patients so far. We have tried to look at some less invasive, you know, non-pet ways of discerning baseline features that would predict positive response to levodopa, as well as what changes when we treat people. And um, this was a study of uh, structural data from MRI scans, where we tried to look at um, cortical thickness and regional brain volumes in a processing speed network, which you see here on the right, and also a motor network. Um, where we did see there were a couple areas in the motor network where uh, cortical thinner cortex in, in primary motor cortex and supplementary motor area were linked to uh, slowed gait speed at baseline. And then it, in some of these features, uh, we saw that uh, you know, uh, cortical thinning and lower volumes at baseline predicted greater response in processing speed to levodopa at endpoint. This wasn't tremendously powerful. So we, we tried to look uh, farther afield for better MRI uh, ways to assess the uh, dopamine system at baseline and then the effects of our treatments and began collaborating with uh, some uh, colleagues at Columbia uh, on neuromelanin sensitive MRI scans, which I find very interesting. We don't have time to go into this uh, too much, but you may know you see here a slice of midbrain and some of the most highly pigmented cells in the body are in the substantia nigra pars compacta. Why are they black? They're black because they have a lot of neuromelanin in them. It, it was really the roles and function and significance of neuromelanin were really unknown until quite recently when Dave Solzer uh, about 20 years ago, who's at Columbia and is a very uh, brilliant investigator, should propose this pathway whereby uh, cytosolic dopamine, which is packaged into vesicles you know, for release, uh, but uh, residual or remaining dopamine in the cytosol is oxidized uh, by iron into various forms and then incorporated into these autophagosomes as uh, containing neuromelanin, and that this builds up normatively across the lifespan as a byproduct of dopamine synthesis. Now, it wasn't really known what does this neuromelanin do, and it appears that it may be a bit of a double-edged sword, that um, it, neuromelanin uh, accumulation can be neuroprotective by, through this antioxidant capacity here. However, in the event that these neurons die and microglia uh, kind of digest and clear the cell, they can become sensitized and lead to further neurodegeneration. So there may be both protect, neuroprotective roles of neuromelanin and also ways that it could be linked to neurodegeneration. But uh, my point here is that neuromelanin can be used as a signal of how much dopamine uh, a person has been making over time. And my colleagues, uh, this is a paper by Cliff Cassidy working in Guillermo Horga's lab, where they did a series of elegant studies in this PNAS paper, uh, where they showed that neuromelanin signal on MRI scan is sensitive to variation in, they actually had midbrain slices where they measured uh, postmortem neuromelanin concentrations, and they showed a relationship between those postmortem studies and neuromelanin signal on MRI scan. They also did an amphetamine release paradigm where they measured uh, raclopride, decreased raclopride binding with an amphetamine challenge and healthy controls and showed that uh, neuromelanin uh, signal was associated with dopamine release capacity. So again, this idea that neuromelanin, the more dopamine you're making, the more excess dopamine is in the cytosol, the more that gets oxidized and turned into neuromelanin. So it's in a, in a way, a uh, we call it a hemoglobin A1C. It's kind of a longer term measurement of uh, dopamine synthesis and dopamine release capacity. We looked at this in this pilot study that I was telling you about, and here are some data from it. And, and if neuromelanin signal at baseline is associated with greater neuromelanin signal is associated with faster gait speed, as one would expect. They're not as dopamine depleted. Um, similarly, people respond better. It, it's people who are low neuromelanin and neuromelanin signal who respond best to our um, uh, levodopa administration. So here you see the you, you see a greater increase in digit symbol improvement with levodopa 
in people who have low neuromelanin signal at baseline. In other words, if you have a low neuromelanin signal, you're dopamine depleted and you have a lower baseline speed, but you're a person who could potentially respond well to dopamine repletion. One interesting thing, and I hesitate to even talk about it because it's so few subjects, but I just bring it up because this, we were, this is actually the first paper to show a, an a acute change in neuromelanin, where in, our, in six patients from this study, we had a, a post-treatment scan available on neuromelanin-sensitive MRI, and we actually showed a significant mean increase in neuromelanin signal after three weeks of levodopa administration. This is really the first time anyone's ever shown uh, that the signal can increase with a levodopa challenge. So we're going on in this R33 phase. We're doing a bit larger study, the larger sample size here. We're doing pre and post treatment imaging. We're now comparing our optimized dose of 450 of levodopa to placebo, and we want to see how it works for depression. I'll just quickly mention two other future directions. One is that, um, as you may have said to yourself as I've been talking, hey, isn't that effect size a bit modest here? You haven't exactly um, solved the problem completely with this levodopa administration. And we agreed with that sentiment and we're impressed by this Parkinson's literature about the value of exercise and how exercise can be neuroprotective in Parkinson's disease patients. And it also just, I have to admit, made sense to me in a very commonsensical way that if we believe people are slowed down for a CNS reason and we replete their dopamine levels and their ability to move more quickly, if those people then lay around on the couch and don't move, that they may have a limited benefit. Similarly, exercise is an effective monotherapy for depression. And yet, if a person doesn't have the uh, CNS capacity to move, they may not get the full benefits of exercise. So we thought, what if we put these two treatments, each associated with modest effect sizes together in an effort to realize a better improvement. So we're doing a study right now where we randomize patients to levodopa or placebo and aerobic exercise or a stretching and toning control condition, hypothesizing that the combination of levodopa, these are depressed older patients, of course, um, hypothesizing that levodopa in combination with aerobic exercise will uh, do better for us than uh, either one alone. And we send these treadmills to people's homes and we, have, we follow them with heart rate monitors and all this and they do quite well with that. Secondly, uh, and this is where the esteemed Dr. Taylor comes in, Again, I've showed you these relationships, but I haven't really explained or given you a mechanism or some kind of satisfying explanation for why should speeding people up treat their depression. And we, we believe that this may have to do with reward processing and in particular effort-based decision-making, which is schematized here. Reward processing involves a number of discrete steps, many of which, but not all of which involve dopamine. What, first, a decision-making phase where a rodent or person evaluates the options available when a, there's a potential reward to be sought in the environment that entails a certain amount of effort cost. There's a decision-making about, is the reward value worth the effort cost? There's an anticipatory period followed by, in, in, in the case that the decision is made to approach the reward, some impetitive behaviors, you get the reward, you have a hedonic response, and then some perhaps predictionnaire-based reinforcement learning. And our prediction was that slowing significantly increases effort costs for older adults, such that the same reward values now entail a lot more work. And so that it may tip the pre before slowing a balance that was in favor of seeking out a reward. If you greatly increase the effort cost, you could tip a balance in the other direction, lead people to not behave as much. And so Warren Tyler and I uh, sought and received funding to evaluate this as a potential mechanism. And we have this study that uh, called the D3 study where we are, where we, we're looking at how aging and inflammation may re reduce dopamine functioning according to various PET and MRI metrics, thereby uh, decreasing willingness to work for a reward of a given value, adversely affecting uh, re reward decision-making through its effects on slowing, increasing effort costs and eventually leading to late life depression. We're going to be doing anything you can think of that to assess dopamine, we're doing it in uh, this study. 
And uh, at baseline, we're doing a levodopa versus placebo challenge, repeating our measures and then doing a crossover. So I know I'm running out of time, but just very briefly, I recognize and I hope you recognize Dopaminergic decline is not the only thing that happens to us as we age that's related to neuropsychiatric health. Of course, there's the cerebrovascular story. Uh, there is hearing loss as, as people, as we all get presbycusis as we age, basically ubiquitous. Hearing loss, if it's untreated, is a one of the biggest risk factors for cognitive decline and, and depression. It's a good example of an aging-based process that leads to neuropsychiatric problems that are not treated by antidepressants alone. Why not treat the hearing loss? Just like why not treat the dopamine? Frailty and its underlying basis of mitochondrial dysfunction and declining ATP output and many other examples. So that what we do in my lab is try to understand this bi-directional relationship and interaction between aging processes and later life neuropsychiatry. We've been talking about this direction, just how do certain aging processes um, influence how and when and whether later life disorders present? Can we come up with ideas about novel therapeutic targets? How can we, uh, and also how can we understand this to really deconstruct the heterogeneity of things like late life depression and, and determine who we're going to focus in on? If we look in this other direction, of course, the occurrence of psychiatric disorders across the lifespan influences aging. If you Google pretty much any psychiatric uh, diagnosis at this point, it's been associated with accelerated aging, and some of that may have more interest and merit than others, but we may be in a good position now that we have some very well-defined metrics of aging to uh, be able to detect when is somebody getting off of a healthy aging trajectory and how can we help with that. To do that, I submit we're going to have to really change how we evaluate patients in our clinics, which we have done and I expect you guys are doing as well. I make fun of my mentor and point out to him the impoverished nature of his assessments back in 1999, which he thought were all state of the art. And now if you look at what we're doing in our clinic, we're not only tricking out our neurocognitive assessments, but we look at sleep, we look at frailty, we look at hearing, we look at cellular aging, we get we, physical functioning uh, very much so. So we need to look at all these things to try to understand what's wrong with our patients, what do we need to help with? And that to sum up in my last slide here, you know, really what we want to do and what I've been talking about is we have late life depression, which is extremely heterogeneous. You can take a number of aging based roads to end up in the same place, late life depression, but there's a lot of diversity etiologically in here. The current state of the art is to empirically treat everyone with antidepressants, irrespective of why they got depressed. And that doesn't get us very far. What we want to do is a more careful and more comprehensive evaluation that encompasses these important aging processes and then tailor our treatments to the specific problem and, and, the, and the type of patient who's going to respond to that treatment and hopefully that's going to do us better. I'd like to thank uh, Everyone, involved. I have a host of amazing uh, collaborators and colleagues, not least among them, Warren Taylor and colleagues at Vanderbilt. Um, and thanks to all our funding organizations and of course our patients. So maybe that would be a good time to, I, I hope I left, I left four minutes for questions if that is okay. That is great. And we actually have a few uh, questions already for you. So Brett, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'll dive in the question. Uh, Ariel Deutsch, who's done a fair amount of work on his own in dopamine, has a question of uh, is reduced gait speed data, is that controlled for stride length? Yeah, well, um, yes, we control it by leg length. So, so we do measure people's uh, leg lengths and um, that goes into the analysis. So people who are taking longer strides versus others, uh, yes, we do endeavor to, to control for that. Great. Although it's not always, I mean, certainly, it, this is in our finer grain. If you just look at epidemiologic studies of gait speed as it, as it predicts, you know, they're just looking at, they're not doing a fancy gait kinetic assessment or looking at anything, but they are, um, uh, so gait speed, even not uh, correcting for that is a very powerful indicator. Okay. Another question is thinking about uh, other augmentation strategies. So for stimulants, for example, do you think that stimulants may exert their benefit through similar mechanisms to L-DOPA? Could they be used interchangeably? 
Yes, that's an interesting question, and, and I don't know the answer. We ended up, when we were um, beginning this line of work, we were uh, thinking about dopamine receptor agonists, stimulants, and levodopa. And really, we were endeavoring to select one of those to begin our research on this. And we just felt that levodopa was the safest uh, option amongst those that bunch and um, what had the most evidence of being associated with cognitive and physical function changes. So we opted for that. I, I don't know, ex obviously, um, you know, but study, many studies and Helen Lavretsky and others who have shown uh, stimulant augmentation for treatment resistance and late life depression, you know, that I wouldn't, if my guess would be that it would work according to some of these similar mechanisms, but, but I don't know. And I think for our study, if I recall, we also did selective l because it's cleaner. It just, we know it's more specific. Is, is that your recollection as well? Yes. Yes. And I think that, I don't think the safety issues should be underestimated because, you know, the cardiovascular, we're dealing with older adults who have many cardiovascular risk factors, even if they don't have an arrhythmia or a stroke, the effects of chronically increasing heart rate and blood pressure incrementally may not be great. And so I do have concern about the long-term safety of stimulant use and, so, and such in our patients. But yeah, I, I do believe that this is a more targeted, not just kind of, and also as I think about it, kind of the presynaptic neuron, you're not just with levodopa, we're repleting the whole system, we hope from increasing the amount of dopamine present in vesicles, allowing more to be released. We're not just inducing release of the vesicles or preventing reuptake. If you don't have very much dopamine in your vesicles, stimulants may not be as effective, theoretically. Great. And we still have another minute, so I'll have one follow-up question is, the data, your data nicely showed changes dopamine receptor binding potential in dorsal striatum, but one might expect the more relevant side to be for both mood and movement would be in the ventral striatum or the accumbens. Um, have you followed ventral striatal activity over time and dopamine receptor changes? Um, chronic levodopa clearly can result in changes in dopamine receptor uh, binding potential. And I guess the follow-up question is, do you have any data on other things like tetrabenazine for vesicular uh, binding potential, which may be um, a better index uh, for the integrity of the dopamine system? No to the latter. I'd be very interested in learning more about that. And it sounds like I could be uh, educated and perhaps some interesting uh, options there. I think we've been focused on, you know, since we have been operating from this model that slowing and the associated effort cost of voluntary behavior is really playing a key role here, we've really wanted to go after the, you know, uh, kind of dopaminergic underpinnings of processing speed and gait speed. So, um, you know, we haven't looked as much at ventral striatal stuff and, and more and hedonia and other elements of reward, though that's what we're going on to do here in D3 and some other studies to get a better idea of that. So I'm sorry that I don't have a very satisfying answer for you there. And I think another one you can answer quickly is, have you looked at primapexel rather than uh, levodopa? No, certainly I have colleagues who have done a lot of, uh, not in older adults, but have looked at Premipexel and just MDD and um, you know, had pretty disappointing results in terms of altering reward processing and, and also augmenting uh, depression response. So um, I think it's an option. And I don't, um, I'm not, my work is not aiming to show the absolute primacy of levodopa over other methods, but really to kind of investigate, uh, you know, dopaminergic signaling as a target. And there may be more than one ways to, to skin that cat. I tend to think from what I know, levodopa is uh, the safest uh, kind of most studied approach. So I like it from those perspectives, but it could be that receptor agonists would be good as well. Um, unfortunately, we had a couple other questions, but I think we are out of time and I know everyone has things to get to. Um, Brett, again, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you for being a great collaborator the last couple of years. and. Um, Thank you for spending your, uh, your day with us here. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor. I appreciate the invitation. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.